Well, F1 returned to normal, didn't it? With Lewis Hamilton winning the Bahrain Grand Prix yesterday here in sunny Manama. But wasn't the podium celebration weird? Did you hang around for that? I've never seen anything like that. More in a moment. There you have it, a 1-3 finish for Mercedes. Max Verstappen splitting the pair. What an exciting race. Admittedly, I had to catch the excitement after the event because I wasn't getting the full radio call from BBC Five because of internet dramas. But let me step you through what I experienced on the Saturday and Sunday at the Sakia circuit. I will start with race day, and drivers normally get there uh, anywhere from six hours prior to the start of the race to say three hours prior to the start. Charles was one of the first in, I missed him, and the other drivers probably between four and five hours prior to the race, they rolled up. Most of them at the main entrance, but Mick Schumacher, Nikita Mazepin, Nicholas Latifi, who had his girlfriend with him, Polish model Sandra Zivasek, who looked to treat on both days, and Carlos Sainz also came in that gate. I asked why, and Carlos Honoro told me it was because they had a massage table, which meant that they weren't coming in the main gate. And unfortunately, I only got him on the Friday when he was kicking a soccer ball, a football, around as he made his way up to the swipe gates and into the paddock. Oh, and, and Kimmy, I don't know what gate Kimmy came in because he never came in any of the gates that I was near unless he was coming in at some crazy early hour. Daniel Ricciardo arrived in a Nissan patrol and as Daniel walked in, he mentioned the fact that we all want to be where you were back in Perth, Australia, because of course, we have no real COVID dramas. Fernando Alonso was busily prepping his hat and his sunnies as he arrived. And I'll do a separate video about how important it is to have all the right kit on for your sponsors when you arrive into a Grand Prix. That'll be upcoming. For the first time, I shot George and his girlfriend, Carmen. And funnily enough, that picture of George with Carmen outrated a picture of Lewis Hamilton by a staggering degree. Now, it suggests to me that the wives and partners of F1 drivers are more interesting than the actual F1 drivers. Maybe they're oversaturated, who knows? The thing is, when we shoot these drivers arriving, the backdrop is an ugly car park, and we're shooting often into the sun, so I don't think the photos are that great. But often as a driver passes me and goes through into the paddock, I'll turn around and shoot them into the paddock. Most of the time they've got their back to me, but sometimes they turn around and they're beautifully lit, and you get perhaps a different reaction because they're a little bit more relaxed because they're inside the paddock and sometimes there's no cameras pointing at them, sometimes it's just me and maybe one or two others. And on the subject of backs, I'll be doing a backpack rundown of which drivers carry what backpacks coming up in uh, the coming week or so when I've got very little to do and a lot of time to play with. Sergio Perez was dropped off at 1.12 p.m. exactly, and I can tell you that because I needed to take a picture of his watch for another video I'm doing, and there it is. That is the Tag Heuer Formula One Quartz Chronograph Blue Men's Watch, which retails for around 1,750 Australian dollars. That's just under 1,000 British pounds. After all the drivers had arrived, I popped up to the other entrance because I had to go and get a COVID test. This was my sixth COVID test of my life, and of course it came back negative, hence I'm okay to travel today. And I should say that uh, Kennedy.com is the world's best online staff training platform. I know that because I'm intimately involved in it and I recommend it to you highly. Get on board at Kennedy.com if you're looking for staff training for your crew. Once the drivers have arrived, there's not much to do. So I head back to the media center, do a bit of editing, a bit of social media posting, and then we hang around for the grid. And this was my first ever grid COVID style. Normally we're allowed on the grid, and we can walk around and be near the teams, but this time we have to stand on the edge of the track. So it's the outside of the track, and there's a meter gap between the very high wire fence and the armco. And the thing is that all the odd numbered cars, well, not the odd numbered cars, the cars starting from odd numbered grid positions, one, three, five, seven, etc., are on our side of the track. So we can get very close to the drivers and get some fine detailed shots, like this one of Fernando Alonso's eye. I should say too that it was cold, yeah. With Pierre starting in fifth, I was able to get pretty close to him and I could see that they were going through some data. Now, I'm not sure where that data was gleaned, but uh, interesting to have a look at here. All those little graft lines obviously mean something and they were going over them. Travel websites are cheeky. They track your IP address and the prices they offer you are based on where you're browsing from. If you use a VPN for travel, 
You can hide your IP address and you may be able to benefit from lower flight prices. For example, if you set your IP address to a lower income country, you could find flights are a lot cheaper. I did see Ferrari boss Mattia Bonotto give Mick Schumacher a little bit of a uh, reassuring hand on the shoulder and have a quick chat with him before he headed out. He didn't have a great race and ended up, I think, last of the finishes, wasn't he? He did better than his teammate Mazepin, who spun. Oh, and I did see this funny website that's popped up. Uh, harsh, but yeah, that's what happens when you put your name out there. People are going to have a crack at you. Now, Golf Air did a flyover, but at some point I looked up and I thought, that plane hasn't been over us and it's banking away from the straight. So perhaps you can tell me in the comments, was there something odd about that? Did it have a uh, a go round perhaps because I saw it later on um, but no it definitely didn't go over the top of us when we were down on the grid. Grid done, back on the shuttle bus, stop at turn one to let a couple of guys off at the tower then I went up to turn four hoping to get some sparking shots of cars coming up that straight. Didn't get it unfortunately, it was a pretty bloody awful shot really. Now, these are the shots looking down at the track but if I turn 180 degrees and look behind me this is what I see, some interesting countryside and a beautiful full moon. Unfortunately, no way of putting a car in that full moon. That would be a dream shot if that ever lined up. I probably lasted 10 laps at turn four and then I tried two or three other spots but nothing sensational happened in front of me. It was no German Grand Prix of 2019, that's for sure. And then in the end, I think I got the bus with about nine laps left to go back around to the outside of the track where we wait until the track clears and then we can rush across to uh, shoot the podium. And I should say thank you to Ibrahim, our driver. Here he is down at the end of the race watching the cars come across the finishing line. Hello Ibrahim. I'm good. What about you? Excellent mate. Thank you. The beauty of having a driver and a shuttle bus between I think there was only five of us was that we were able to very quickly say, hey, we need to be over here. And uh, Ibrahim would come and pick us up on the little road that skirts around the track and get us to wherever we needed to go quickly. So it meant that we could shoot in more spots during a session. And with the one hour sessions instead of an hour and a half during practice, that was vital. Once the track had cleared, we race across and we shoot the podium and it was bizarre. They announced first, second and third, gave them their trophies, gave them their bottle of rose water, not champagne as you will note. There is no branding on there because of alcohol laws here. But there was no spraying. I can't tell you why and maybe you know why, in which case I'd love to see your comments below. There was Lewis pouring it over his counterpart, I think his name is Russell Braithwaite, but there was no spraying and that's what we wanted to see. Champagne spraying excited people up on the podium, but it didn't happen, did it? And what did you think about that big digital screen behind the drivers with the graphics that pop up with um, first, second and third? It looked pretty impressive. Now, some other interesting stuff that I noted over the weekend, I found Andrea with this super slow-mo camera. My gosh, it's worth over 100,000 something, so I'm guessing US dollars. It shoots at 1,000 frames a second. It's super slow-mo. It's got a 500 millimeter Canon lens on the front. And get this, he can only shoot 10 three second videos before the cards fall. And the battery itself doesn't last that long. And, oh, and by the way, it's manual focus to add another degree of difficulty. Very impressive stuff. Speaking of television, Netflix were again there. They're doing another series. This year, they've got four crews instead of three. So will they get more content? You'd have to think so. And get this, the teams have a right to say no to something that they don't want to go to air. So if uh, Charles Leclerc says something in an interview that Ferrari doesn't like, Ferrari can say, nope, take that out, we don't want it in there. Dancing around here a bit, on Saturday night I went outside the swipe gates after the session, caught Toto Wolff coming out having a chat with Andreas Seidel, and I think I said to Andreas the next day on Sunday, I said, you're having an interesting chat with Toto there the other night, and he said, all chats with Toto are interesting. And then my ears pricked up when I heard the Australian National Anthem play, and I thought, What's going on there? And Oscar Piastri, an Australian youngster, had just won the F2 event in his, I think it was only his second race. His trainer is Kim Keedle, who was also an Australian and worked with Roman Grosjean last year. So Kim was pretty happy. And what about the BIC tower lit up magnificently with the logos of each of the 10 teams, plus a whole lot of other graphic designs. I stood there for about 15 minutes to capture all of these shots and was totally spellbound by it. A really beautiful installation. I've been in Bahrain now for 24 days. Not sure where I'm going yet, but I'll end up at Imola, 
in three weekends time for the second round of the Formula One Grand Prix season. And let's hope we get another close race and some excitement because I've never shot at Imola before. And if you've enjoyed this video, I'm gonna ask you to like it by pressing a button, no big deal. Subscribe if you haven't done so, so you get more of my videos. And if you wanna get notifications, click on the notifications button. And at the end of this video, you're gonna see the names of all the VIP members. If you're looking for a picture for your office or private use, you can download my digital images at ProStarPix.com and even purchase them for editorial purposes. You'll find my F1 driver's books all updated now with new picks from the first two events, testing and race here in Bahrain at KimIllman.com and someone's smashing pans upstairs in the restaurant. And for all my best stories and pictures live from the track and during the week, head to Instagram and search at Kim Illman. With that said, I'm gonna say thank you for watching and stay passionate, my friends. And I, what's that noise? What is that noise up there? These people are VIP members of my YouTube channel. You too can become a VIP member. All you need to do is click on the join button next to the subscribe button. But if you can't see that because in some countries it's hidden, there's a link in the description below. And now it's definitely time to say goodbye.